Sunday before the Sunday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> we can give thanks already, can't we? Amen. Yeah, that's exciting. And we're gathering together. God is bringing the people together. Uh, it's kind of an exciting time for our conference and for some of the people at our church because this is the weekend of pilgrimage which uh, is an exciting youth event which is happening right now and we have a pretty nice contingent from this church with uh, youth and adults that are there they've been enjoying themselves um, they'll be back later today so we we just could pray for a strong ending to pilgrimage <clears throat> saw some pictures on our church's facebook page that melanie sent about kids going to the altar hundreds of kids going to the altar for healings, for reconciliation, giving their lives to Jesus Christ. Uh, that's, that's good stuff. So I know many of you have invested in getting the kids to pilgrimage. And so that's been a good investment. It's been a good investment. And we, we just pray for that to be a, a really big success. Have a thank you note that came into the church this week um, from Jim Hopkins. Jim Hopkins, he says, Dear folks, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to write this note. I was in rehabilitation facility for six weeks following a surgery. I'm dealing with no hip and a bum right arm. <laughs> uh, it's, knocked me, it's knocked out my left arm and all kinds of things like that. So now that I'm home, I deal with challenges like uh, how to hold a fork or even this pen. I've not made it to church yet. That's my loss, and I will as soon as possible. I want to thank all of the crew that came, friends and neighbors from the church were uh, uh, my, he was having a hard time. Uh, a group from the church went and built him a wheelchair ramp, and he's, he's saying thank you for that. Um, I could not get into the house without the ramp. And it looks great, and it's well built, and he's very excited. And he says, uh, you were God sent, and may God continue to bless all of us. Very truly, Jim Hopkins. And uh, I know the turkey shoots have been moving forward, and we thank you who are working with that. I know that it's, uh, it's just such a vital thing for friendships and all of that, but also a great fundraiser, helping kids get to camp, and so we, Jerry and others, we thank you for that. Want to make you aware of the fact that this evening at 6 o'clock for our members, you can come to that meeting to uh, take up those two issues that we'll be voting on. One is the governance system that's been proposed to replace the governance system that we have in place. And then secondly, we're gonna vote on whether or not to uh, change the name of the education building to the crossing. That's just something that is uh, something we've been put on hold for quite a while. So we invite you to come. And uh, it will be a ballot, so we won't be putting people in a position of raising their hand or anything like that, so, so come. Your bulletin has announcements in it. I don't know if there's anything else any of you would like to specifically lift up. Okay. Well, at this time, I'm going to read from our bulletins names of folks that we are praying for, as well as names that have come in just this morning. So join us in praying for Hurley Dixon, Wally Sneed, Dan Freeman, Thurston Cumby, Bertha Long, Bill Cohen, and the families of Michael Purvis, Judy Heil, and Hinton Fulford. And this morning, we're asking for prayers for Leo Fulford, Mark Magelli, and Tim Huber, and the persecuted Christian church in the world that we are focusing our prayers on today is the church in Myanmar. So we turn this time over to the worship of the Lord. 
Good morning. If you'd please stand if you're able and join us as we worship this morning. Loving God, we gather this morning as children whom you have adopted, blessed, and made a part of your family. As we worship, may your Holy Spirit help us to recognize our part in the story that you are writing as you bring your kingdom to earth. We praise your holy name. Amen. Amen.
mission, together stating the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I've got uh, something kind of interesting to show the kids, but it's something that some of you might want to come down and take a look at. It's not going to translate real well over video, so sorry, uh, those of you who are out there. But come on down, and we may need even a, a third person. But this is a timeline that's upside down. All right, this is a timeline of human history. This is the story of people. Yeah, come on out here and take a look. This time I'm going to invite you to come. Yeah, we got it backwards again. 35 years. Almost, we're doing good. Look at this. This is the story of people. God's people. Isn't this fun? It just keeps going and going and going and going. Take a look at that. That's the story of God's people. This is Adam and Eve over here. This is the beginning of people. Adam and Eve. And if you go down far enough, Jesus is there. Eventually, Jesus is written into the story of people to go to the cross and to save us all. And eventually, there's more people that come and more people that come. And if you see where Mr. Vern is, at the very end, that's a space for you and for me to be written into the story of God's people. What do you think about that? Anybody? That's amazing. Really, our story is only a little tiny part of it, but our story is as important as anybody else's story. God loves us all the same, and God is interested in writing us into God's story because every person is special to God. Every person was created to be loved by God just the way you're loving each other. I love that. Today we're talking about writing ourselves and being written by the Spirit of God into God's story. And it's a beautiful thing that we have. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your story that you made us to love us, to care for us, and to care for your creation. I pray for these boys that as they grow, they would understand their special place in your story. You've grafted us in like branches. Bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them as they continue on the story of what you do in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now I've got to try to do this backwards. We'll see how it goes. And then there's more. There's more. See if we can do it. See all these shoebox gifts it's okay you, you can sit all right i i pulled the trick on you and prayed and shoebox gifts that everybody brought in today every single one of these is going to go to some boy or girl someplace in the world this one's going to a boy between five and nine years old and it's heavy i think there's some good stuff in here 
And so what I'm going to ask is for all of you to just reach out your hands, and we're going to together bless these shoeboxes. It's okay. Don't be shy. It's okay. It's not, it's not a silly. It's a blessing. This is a chance that we have to be a blessing. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint these boxes filled with love, filled with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his love for his children. I pray that each uh, pair of socks, I pray that every coloring book, that every little toy or even some underwear would be uh, a sign to these kids that someone in this world loves them. And most importantly, that you love them and have great plans for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Very good. It's a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. Every single one of those is going to touch some, some little kid somewhere in this world. We're fixing to take pretty good care of the kids in this neighborhood, too. Stay tuned for that. Uh, plans that we have to bless the kids. Lord, we're grateful that you've written us into your story. You could have written it without us, and yet, in your grace and in your love, you have chosen us. You have taken us as as loose branches and you've grafted us into your family, into your source of life. By your Holy Spirit, you have gifted us with abilities that we would never have had without you. You've given us a vision for life that goes beyond our own selves, for life that goes beyond surviving, but into thriving. We sang about that earlier, Lord. We were made to thrive, and it's all because you're a God of abundance, not a God of lack. And we praise you today. We thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that the youth are experiencing with their chaperones at pilgrimage, and pray that you would do a mighty work among them, that they would be coming back afreshed and inspired and ready to go. Thank you for those who are serving in the nursery this morning. Thank you for those who have been working in the office, for those working at the turkey shoot and who've been out in so many different ways, shining the light of Jesus, trying to make a difference in this world, Lord, because you have made a difference in us. When it's truly you, that's blessed us, we can't help ourselves but to reach out and bless others. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon this church, Sharon United Methodist Church, as it has been for so many generations, that we would be a faithful people, doing what you would have us do. And hopefully, Lord, what you would have us do would line up perfectly with what we would love to do. for all what is already happening for the good work, the ministry, the, the changed lives, the testimonies, how you're working. And of course, today, Lord, we lift up those who are in the need of prayer, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. God, be a source of peace for them today. For those who are sick or in long-term care facilities, God, may your grace cover them May your healing power and may joy even penetrate into those points. We pray for people who work in facilities, nursing homes, and assisted living places and hospitals where there's so much sadness around God. You have also planted your church in those places too, bringing love and hope and joy wherever those folks are. Continue to pray for our nation, that you would heal divides among us, that we would find some common ground to sink our teeth into and to stand on so that we can move forward as a beacon of freedom, as a beacon of hope, 
in a world that needs to know love. Lord, help us to raise up leaders out of this church who will speak about justice, who will speak about mercy, who will speak the truth of your word, who would not be ashamed of the gospel. Father, as members come tonight to cast their ballots, I pray that your spirit would move in that too, that your will would be done. Lord, there's so much to thank you for. You have been good. Thank you for our families, and as we anticipate this season of Thanksgiving, help us to not forget how blessed we really are to look for opportunities to share that blessing with others, God. Single moms and widows, people that have lost their jobs, people who are struggling, Lord, help, help us to, to really understand what you want to do, to revive spirits and to bring hope. And Lord, for our, our membership that's hurting today, May we come around them well. May we understand that we made a promise to take care of each other. As you have made a promise to always be with us. So let us not falter in that, but rather be excellent at that. And now as we move forward in our time of worship, we lift a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him, how should we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time as we prepare to give and receive our tithes and our offerings. you've been good to us. Your word tells us everything that we have belongs to you. You've loaned us these, these gifts and we're giving back to you part of that. We want to be faithful. We desire to make a difference for your kingdom and we dedicate these tithes and offerings to just that here through Sharon United Methodist Church. In the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.
Good morning. The first reading today is from the book of John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 15. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not John himself, but his disciples who baptized. He left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're continuing on with a sermon series having to do with rebuilding. Started out a few weeks ago talking about what we all know that we've taken some hits, not just in the world, but in our nation, certainly here at Sharon. I've never seen I've never seen this 845 service with 150 or 200 people in it, which was what I guess it was before the pandemic. I long for the day when that will happen and and more, but thank you, thank you for being here and for positioning yourself to be in that, that place of strong foundation. Because when we, when we have everything taken away from us, the things that, that don't move are the things that God put here. God puts immovable things in place. And we talked about that. And as we talk about building now, we talk about a foundation of compassion. We, we dealt with that. Of course, every time I speak of something like that, God gives our church family all kinds of opportunities to be compassionate. The phone was off the hook for the last couple of weeks about people in need. And I am proud to be able to say our church family has been able to help quite a few people just in this last couple of weeks. And I know moving toward the holidays, we'll be doing that more and more. Praise the Lord that we're in a position to do that, uh, showing compassion to our neighbors and to our own church family as well, as we're, we're not all uh, real flush these days. We need to help each other. Last week, we talked about reclaiming the concept of community, of coming together, of erasing the, really the evils of social distancing, which we all kind of had to do, but declaring that it's it's time to come together. Uh, It was great to be with the the men's group last Thursday night around the tables having Thanksgiving. And there were a bunch of guys. It was great. And last, this past Thursday around the breakfast table, things like that uh, make life better. Today I want to talk about being written and help, helping people to be written into God's connecting story. You see, we have been scattered. This was going on way before any pandemic. 
We have people that don't know who they are. We have people out there in the world just surviving, people who've been parentless, people who've never been told that God loves them. We have people that just don't know how good life can be when you're connected to the family of God. They just have no idea. They think that they're always going to be on the outside looking in. And today I want to, to express to you using the word of God and just our own experiences that that doesn't match the gospel. It's God's desire that in the end we get written in because the church does its job and shares the good news. There will be some that refuse ever to be written in to God's story. That's a sad truth. There will be some who will refuse and they will never be part of God's story. But that should never be because one of us didn't give them the opportunity. The Holy Spirit is churning out there. It's stirring people's hearts. They're looking for God. And we know God, don't we? We know God and we have that blessed opportunity to share God with those people who are seeking so a partnership with the Holy Spirit, with hearts that are seeking, and a people who are willing to share. That's what we're talking about today. In our first scripture this morning, Jesus met a woman of Samaria. And if you know much about times that Jesus was living in, the Jews didn't have anything to do with Samaritans. They were religious half-breeds. They were people who were partly of the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the other half of their family tree was pagan worshipers and idolaters, and they were living outside of God's will because they didn't know how they fit in. And so Jesus spoke with this woman, and she said, Hey, man, you can't really be talking to me. Don't you know I'm a lowly Samaritan? You're a Jew. We can't be doing this. And Jesus said, Yeah, but if you knew who you were talking to, right? If you knew who you were talking to, this meeting at this well was no accident. You're here, and I'm here. And I'm thirsty for water. Will you give me what you have? And she says, yeah. And then he says, but uh, are you thirsty? If you knew who I am, you'd ask me for water, and I would give you water, spiritual water, welling up like a spring from inside. And she said, yeah, give me some of that. Give me some of that water. And, and what, what we didn't read today is that she ends up, we call that, she gets saved. She meets Jesus. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. She runs back to her town in Samaria, where she wasn't all that popular, and begins to spread the good news of the gospel in that place that had never heard the gospel. They certainly had never even imagined that they could ever be regrafted into the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, much less the people of a kingdom that will have no end. So today I want to read another New Testament account of another person who was seeking, who ends up getting grafted into the family of God, written into the story of God. So I invite you into book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And this is a relatively familiar story, but I pray that you would hear it in a new way. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, 
and he was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with the scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Ezotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of God for the people of God. It's good stuff. I think it's good stuff. Think of all of human history. We kind of had it out here. You're welcome to take a look if you want to afterward. Just let me tell you, it's, it's not as hard as it looks to fold it back together. But, <laughs> but I think the ultimate ground zero, other than the moment Jesus was nailed to the cross in human experience, was in the days of Noah. The Bible tells us in the days of Noah that the, the hearts of the people and the thoughts of the people in this world were only evil all the time. <laughs> That's a pretty bad description of people, that their hearts and minds were only evil all the time. And we know what happened. God was not pleased with us, and so he decided to, to set the human reset button, and he wiped out the entire planet except for that one family. And he, he made covenant with Noah afterward, and Noah and his family were supposed to begin the process of repopulating the world, and, and they did that. But as human history proves over and over and over again, people have a propensity to lean toward evil. I wish that was not the case. I wish that was, there's plenty of churches in this country especially where they won't talk about that predisposition that people have toward evil and sin. But we have to deal with it. Otherwise, there's no need for salvation. And we, we can feel that we need salvation. We can just feel it. And so the generations after Noah's family did their thing, and they, they made a life for themselves, and they moved out, and they, they created lives for themselves and their families and their children and their children's children. But over time, they did not know God anymore. We know that over time, people had drifted away from worshiping God, and they had gotten sort of self-reliant. But God's redemptive story continued on. God's desire to put things together that are broken never stopped. And that we should shout hallelujah. God's desire to put broken lives back together is 
astounding. It is a great gift. So eventually God picked somebody else. He picked a couple by the name of Abraham and Sarah, and he said, listen, I have chosen you among all the other people in this world to be a special people. You will have kids, and their kids will have kids, and their kids will have kids, and your descendants will be blessed. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And as they receive blessings from me, they will go out into the world, and they will bless the world. They will share the blessing. This is God's desire through Abraham and Sarah to bless the world, to reclaim all of that lost territory in human lives for the intent purpose of blessing the world. We can't say that enough about our God, that God's intentions are to bless the world especially to bless the world through God's people who don't know God. Unfortunately, that family grows into what we know as the nation of Israel. And we know that story too, that eventually those people, after generations and generations of that covenant, Israel turned away from God's will, they got caught up in pride, idolatry, bigotry. You can see it with the treatment of the Samaritans. Their focus turned inward instead of outward, self-focused instead of other-focused and self-serving. That's what happened to Israel. Israel even broke up and became two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. They couldn't hold together. In God's good narrative story, God's own people wrote themselves right out of the story. How sad is that? God's own people wrote themselves right out of God's story. You could say that that's a, a massive form of sin. Because sin is when we get away from God's will and replace it with our will. And what a sad thing. Imagine being God who created these people and blessed these people and gave them every advantage. And they still, they still wanted something else. Can you imagine the heartbreak that the Lord faced? But here's that good news. God's will is going to be accomplished with or without human cooperation. God's will is going to be accomplished with or without human cooperation. Our reading from the book of Acts this morning talks about how the Holy Spirit sprang into action in the days after Christ. Of course, the way that God accomplished getting people written back into the story was through the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to get into that today, but the cross of Jesus Christ is, is the way that God decided to start writing a new book on top of the original book. It's a new covenant. It's a new invitation. It's a new family, not based on blood relatives, but based on faith in the risen Christ. And in, this, and in this story of Philip, Philip was a, a spirit-filled deacon in the early church. He was a deacon. If you read about the early days of the church when the apostles were getting too tired because there was so much work to be done, serving people and feeding people and taking care of widows, they said, we need some help. And they, they had a meeting and they, they thought about some, some godly men who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they brought them together, and Stephen was one of them. Remember Stephen, the first martyr? He was one of them. Philip was another one. And they laid hands on these guys, and they prayed for them, and they were filled with more with the Spirit, and they were set on mission and ministry for Jesus Christ. And so we've got this Spirit-filled deacon who'd been doing powerful ministry. If you read 
right before this chapter 8, guess what Philip had been doing and where he had been doing it? He was telling people about Jesus in Samaria, the same place where really people weren't supposed to be dealing with Samaritans because they were nasty. They were half-breeds. But Philip remembered the words of Jesus just before he went to be with the Father in heaven, where Jesus gathered his apostles together and said, you're going to be my witnesses. First here in Jerusalem, you can talk to your own people about me. Then Judea, that's that region around Jerusalem. Then you're going to go to Samaria. You're even going to talk to Samaritans. And after that, it's the whole ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. The only reason we're here today is because they found the end of the earth. If you walk two miles that way, you fall off the earth. At least as far as they knew, right? The end of the earth. So how does it work? Philip, he's spirit-filled. He's minding his own business, and an angel says, go. Go. Head out. So he did. Just go south. Okay. As he's going south, he comes across this guy in a chariot, an Egyptian, somebody who was a high-ranking official in the queen's court. The Candace, queen of, of Egypt, was or the Ethiopia was like Pharaoh of Egypt. Candace was a title. He was a high-ranking official in her court. Somehow, he'd been permission, given permission to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Ethiopians don't know anything about this in those days. And yet still, the Lord had put something in his heart that drew him to Jerusalem. And evidently, when he was in Jerusalem, he went to the temple bookstore and bought a copy of Isaiah's prophecy. Because on his way home for pleasure reading in the chariot, he had the scroll of Isaiah out, and he was reading Isaiah 53, which was talking about a prophetic word about Jesus Christ being persecuted and hung on the cross. He was reading this not really knowing what it was about. And at the same time, he was reading this with his heart galvanized toward finding out the truth. Along comes this guy, Philip, running up alongside of the chariot. What are you reading? I'm like, I don't really know. I need somebody to tell me. And Philip's like, dude, I know that. And I know exactly who it's about. It's about Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He he. He paid our sin debt, and he tells them the story. He uses the scripture. And the Ethiopian's like, I want that. There's some water. What's to stop me from getting baptized? And Philip's like, I don't know. Let's do it. So they go down to the water and baptize the guy. As soon as he's baptized, Philip's just transported out of there, and the Ethiopian is a convert to Christianity, goes back to Ethiopia, the oldest known Christian church organized in the world is in Ethiopia today. I think it was because of that. Google it. The oldest organized Christian church in the world is in Ethiopia. Written into the story, that thirsty lady, that Samaritan lady was written into the story. This, this searching soul from Ethiopia was written into the story. And any one of us who have ever made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and been filled by the Spirit have been written into the story. A story that's about life. Life. Abundant and eternal life. Like a spring of living water. If you have never been written into the story because you didn't know you were allowed. I have good news for you. You are. The arms of Jesus are open wide. The invitation to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord is wide open. And 
really what every seeking heart needs to just do is say, Lord, I'm imperfect. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I, I haven't been as loving as I should. I need you, God. Uh, some prayer of confession. And then just take me, Lord. Write me into your story. Save me. This could be your day. Could be your day. And, you know, if you, if you want to be like those kids at pilgrimage who were coming forward at the end of that service last night, come forward. Some of you come forward weekly, and I love that. It's beautiful, rededicating. Somebody might be here saying, I have never really done it. I've always considered myself on the outside of what God is doing, and it doesn't have to be that way. We don't know the future today. So we invite you to do that or speak with me after the service. I'd love to pray with you. A seeking heart, an eager messenger, the Holy Spirit, and the gospel. That's good stuff. A seeking heart. An eager messenger, the Holy Spirit, and the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And that's how we can help rebuild from ground zero. Next week, I'm going to talk about a compass that we can give people that always points true. That always points true. I look forward to sharing that with you. And as the praise team comes, I pray with you. Lord, we know that it is your desire that every man, woman, and child in your creation is written into your story. It was never your intention that we would be separate from you. And I know there are some who will never give their lives to you. Your word is pretty clear on that. And we pray, Lord, that somehow you'd override that, but that's, that's between you and and your people. But for us, may we be faithful bearers of the good news. May we truly understand that there are seeking, thirsty souls out there who need to be told that they're good enough to come into your family. They're good enough to be written into your story. And as they enter in, you will do a work in them and you will use the family sharpen off some of the rough edges and you'll provide them with opportunities to serve and to love and to be transformed. And we want to be part of that here at Sharon, God. We just desperately want to be part of what you're doing. You're recreating work. You're reconciling work. You're soul-saving work. Help us, God.
his story about how he's been written into the, the story of God and inviting other people into that. That blessed my heart. It's, it's about all of us. We all have a story. I pray that this week you'd consider asking God how to share that with somebody. Somebody's seeking. Somebody that you know is seeking. And God's sending them your way. You don't want to miss that. So go with confidence and joy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.